yeah, I'm here. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. This ought to be a better connection now. Okay, um, we're recording. Okay, fine. So, what I was, uh, why don't we do this unless anyone has any other ideas. Let me talk for a little while and people can feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, uh, if you want to take it a different direction or ask any questions, but what I was going to start out with was the way I've seen in my thinking over the years the benefits of the praxeological approach. And praxeology was Mises' term for the logic of action, and so he used that as the foundation of his economic theorizing. So he basically tried to look at what the consequences were in sort of a pure theory of human action, um, and so he derives from this the basic category sort of in a Kantian sense of, um, of uh, means and ends, opportunity cost, things like this, and also some elementary notions of economics like, you know, the idea that um, if, you, uh, if you increase the supply of money, everything being equal, then prices will go down or be inflated. If you increase a minimum wage or if you impose a minimum wage on an economy, then everything being equal, it would cause unemployment. So you can deduce certain things like this. So that's the economic side. Um, in my thinking, when you think about libertarian property rights rules and Lockean homesteading and things like this, if you think of human action as being um, uh, a human being is an actor who is not merely a deterministic behavior, right, but someone who has purpose and choices. Some human actor who looks at the world and, and envisions a certain future, and he's basically uneasy with it, or he thinks he doesn't want what he predicts will come about to come about, and he imagines that he can interfere with the course of events and make it be different in a way that will please him more. So that's sort of the basic framework of human action. So what he does is he employs his knowledge of causal laws, that is physics, basically to decide what means are available, that scarce means in Mises' term, that he can use to change the course of events to achieve the ends he wants. So you can see that the two successful, two ingredients of successful action would be, number one, having available means, means available to you that you can use to causally change what otherwise would happen. So that means the means you employ have to actually work. So if you if you uh, if you try to make a magic spell to have some to make something happen, it's not actually going to work. Or if you do a rain dance to make it rain, it actually won't work. It's not a good means, although you may believe it's so. And you also have to have knowledge. So if you're if you're ignorant of the ability of gunpowder to explode, then you wouldn't use it to make a gun. So you need the combination or the intersection of knowledge and the availability and control of scarce means. Now, in the libertarian sense, the reason we believe in property rights is because the scarce means that are in necessary ingredients of action can only be used by one person for a given uh, purpose. That's what scarcity means. Um, and th this is the purpose of property rights, is to allocate one owner to a given contestable resource. But you can see that this doesn't apply to knowledge, which is one reason why intellectual property law makes no sense and is confused, a confused notion. So for example, um, any number of people can use the same idea or knowledge at the same time, like how to make a fire or how to build a hut or how to sing a song or how to cook a certain food dish or a technique for catching fish or for planting food, etc. But they can, each of them can only use these scarce resources or means um, one at a time. So the property rights are only for the scarce means or resources. So the Lockean idea, which is basically the libertarian idea, says that whenever we identify a scarce resource in reality, that is any possible means that could cause a given result to occur, something that people can clash over or conflict over. When we have such a resource, then civilized people want to say, instead of fighting over this physically, when we have multiple claimants for this resource, we're going to try to solve this in a peaceful, civilized manner. So we're going to try to determine who's got the better claim to this resource and give them some property right in it, and they're going to be the winner 
they're going to be the one who gets to use this thing. And then they can use it peacefully and productively, and everyone else knows that it's theirs. And in this way, we have a free market and capitalism and trade, uh, the division of labor, etc. So the Lockean answer is when there are more than two or more people that possibly could contest a given scarce resource, that is a scarce means, that's a means of human action, then whoever either homesteaded it first, that is, had the first use of it, or who acquired it by contract from a previous owner is the one who has the better claim to it. So, for example, if I am the first one who acquires a resource, like a piece of land or some iron ore from the ground, then I have a better claim than someone who came later, unless I gave it to them by contract. So normally between two people, the one who has the earlier claim to the resource has a better title to it. But that, that can be defeated by certain exceptions. Number one, as I mentioned, would be contract. So even if I had it first, if I contractually transferred it to you by gift or by, by some kind of a sale, then the person I gave it to now has a better claim than me, not because he acquired it first, but because I gave it to him. Okay, And another exception would be if I committed some kind of tort or offense or crime against him. So let's say I, I injure him by invading his property or his body so that I owe him some kind of restitutionary payment. Well, now he's got a better claim to my property because I did something to him that gives him a claim to it. But unless you can find an exception like a contractual bequest or transfer – or some kind of crime or tort, then the guy with the earlier usage right or claim to it, and ultimately going back to the first homesteader, gets it. Now the reason for this is because unless the unless you could have a better claim than latecomers, no one could ever use things in the first place. We would all be living in a world of unowned resources, and no one could use anything. You have to have the right to take things out of the state of nature, out of their unowned state, and start employing them, because if no one could do that, then we wouldn't even be able to live and survive. So there has to be the right to take things out of the state of nature, which means that it basically shows that the earlier claim has to be superior to the later claim. Because if it wasn't superior, then it means you have the right to be the first one to use something, but then someone else could come along and take it away from you right away, which means we're back to violent clashing and conflict, and we don't have any property rights system. So that's sort of the basic framework of the libertarian property rights paradigm, and I think it's implied by the praxeological view of human action. And you can also see that it rules out intellectual property as a type of property, and it implies what other types of things can be property. The question is not what is property. The question is who owns this resource. That's always the question. So I find it helpful not to use the word property to refer to things that we own because then you have a confusion in the discussion. People say, well, what's property? That's never the question. The question is always when we see a scarce resource that people can potentially conflict or clash or fight over, who owns it? That's always the question. Who has a property right in it? Not what is property, but who owns this particular scarce resource? And when you focus on the question that way, then the entire question of intellectual property and rights in intangible or non-scarce things really never arises, or it becomes clear when someone suggests that what's wrong with that, um, with that notion. And it also focuses you on, well, b among peaceful, cooperative people, when, they, when they're focusing on who between multiple claimants to a given resource, who has the better claim to it, then the natural rule would be the one who had it first. I mean, even dogs recognize this, right? If, if one dog is munching at a bowl of food and another dog approaches, the first dog is going to growl and warn him to stay away. So there's a, natural, there's a naturalness to the, to the first come, first serve idea that's at the heart of the Lockean and libertarian idea of, of homesteading. Um, I can take this in other directions, but if anyone has any questions or comments right now, I'd be happy to uh, <coughs> to address some questions. Yeah, um, Eric Faden has a question here. In Locke's book, he mentions a um, you have the right to your property, but you you can't let it spoil. Um, so let's say 
for instance, I have like a vast land and uh, I can't really take care of all of it. Do I lose the right to some of it just because it spoils? I think um, so. So my view is that the basic Lockean idea is libertarian, but a lot of Locke's reasoning he gives are not necessarily libertarian. So, for example, Locke starts out with the idea that God owns the universe and there's a God, and God grants it to human humanity in sort of this commons. And because he grants us this, and he grants us self-ownership rights. So I don't think you really need to start with that to be a Lockean. Um, you just need to go with the basic logic of what he's saying. And then he also has this idea that um, th th there's a part of Locke, which is the proviso, which gets a little bit at what you're suggesting. So Locke said, you could homestead unowned property as long as you leave enough and is good for other people. That's called the proviso. And the more strict you know, anarcho-Austrian libertarians like Hoppe and uh, people like Anthony de Yasse and, and me uh, would reject that. I don't think that that's actually a condition on acquiring property. The reason is um, um, for someone to object to your acquiring an unowned resource, they would have to assert an ownership claim in that resource in the first place, which – means it wasn't unowned at all. So basically, if you assume that it's unowned, no one has the right to object to your acquiring it, whether there's enough and there's good left over for anyone else or not. So there's sort of you have to pick, pick your sides. Now, there's a mutualist argument, which sounds a little bit like what you're getting at, um, which is the idea that if you don't continually use your property, then other people can say squat on it, etc. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's compatible with the strict... Austrian libertarian perspective on Lockeanism. However, as a practical matter, there's something to it in the sense that let's say you homestead a huge tract that is, you know, I mean, look, it's not easy to control property. You have a sort of responsibility to keep it up, to use it. And if you have a huge, huge tract of land that you've acquired somehow, unless you have a lot of resources and you're using the land productively, it's going to be difficult for you to monitor it and police it all the time and make sure that five miles away in some little remote corner of your land, there's not someone squatting on it. Uh, and if you don't do that, then over time, then the community is going to recognize that you've basically abandoned your claim to it by failing to object to people's use of it. So I think there's a natural limit to how much property – um, or how many resources you can acquire by your physical use unless you're actually using it productively, which is why um, Rothbard talks about what he calls the relevant technological unit or RTU in his um, air pollution piece. So he talks about how in a given community there's a certain way of using a resource by human beings and everyone recognizes that and that sort of defines the nature and the boundaries – of the property rights that you acquire when you use something and when you mix your labor with it. Okay. Thank you. I had one more question. It's somewhat similar. Um, I, I think I heard it online once. In the case of um, if you own a house and your neighbor owns the house next door, you, you have allowed your grass to get so long that it's bringing uh, a lot of snakes and um, your snake bites the neighbor's dog and he dies as a result of it. Uh, are you somehow liable? Hmm. I haven't heard that particular example before. I, I think um, the the so the basic question here would be whether and to what extent you're responsible for your property. Now, strictly speaking, in my view, the libertarian idea is a day is an idea of what you have a right to, not what you have responsibility for. You have responsibility for your actions. Right. In other words, you have an obligation, a negative obligation, not to invade the borders of other people. Yeah. So when people say, if you own a piece of property, you're responsible for it, um, they're thinking of something called strict liability in a sense, or they're thinking of the idea that responsibility is coupled with ownership rights. But I think that's not really a very rigorous way of thinking about it because if you really believe that, then let's say you own a gun or a knife and some – some bad guy steals your knife from you, and then he uses the knife to, to hurt someone. Now, under the law, you technically still own the knife. So if you're responsible for whatever's done with your property, then you'd be responsible for the crime this third party committed, which I don't think is correct. 
So I don't think you can say as a blanket matter you're responsible for what happens from your property. You're only responsible for your actions. So the question would be, do you have a duty with your neighbors to keep your grass mowed, to not let snakes infest your lawn, etc.? And I think that'd be a blend of um, uh, inter-neighbor contracts, which is sometimes called restrictive covenants, uh, maybe implicit, maybe explicit. And it would also be a blend of the uh, idea of the attractive nuisance or just the nuisance idea. In other words, are you using your property in a way that interferes with your neighbor's property? Now, the answer to the question I can't, I can't say for my armchair – I would think that if you um, are violating you know, community standards of how reasonable people use their property and your neighbors are complaining that snakes are coming out of your property on the ours and you need to either cut your grass down or let us do it for you and you refuse to let them do it, then probably an argument could be made that you're causally responsible by your actions, right? Yeah, for or the lack snakes, of – or, or, or your inaction when, when – well, your action would be denying permission for others to to put a fence up around your property or to mow your gla your grass on their own. Um, so I think it'd be something like that. Um, I think basically you'd have people they would go to court and they would try to settle these disputes in a reasonable way. And how juries or judges would decide these things in such edge cases is hard to say. But I think basically you could make a case that it was a type of negligence, a type of abuse of your property rights. Okay. All right, well, one more, because you got me thinking about it. When, when you're talking about, so libertarianism is, is, involves negative rights, and I, I have the right to not be attacked by another person. So hopefully it doesn't sound too similar to the last one, but let's say, it, well, if, if you believe in like the Tannehill and Rothbard uh, restitution uh, system, if, if someone's dog uh, attacks me, do I get? Do I have the right to restitution from them? Since obviously the dog can't grant me that. Yeah, th that's a difficult one. I mean, honestly, I haven't worked out in my mind what I think about strict liability and responsibility for property. Like I said, in the knife case, the knife is an inanimate object. So uh, unless you were somehow complicit or even negligent in someone stealing your your weapon, I don't think you're responsible for for that. You're. You, I think the basic libertarian idea is that you're responsible for your actions. So the question would be, by having a dog, which is an animate object that you own, and by, by, having, by being the only one that has the legal right in the community to control the dog, in other words, no one else has the right to put a leash on your dog because you own it, then does that imply some kind of responsibility to, to be responsible in the exercise of those rights? And I think you could argue that it does because it's an implication of the idea that you can perform any action that you want except invading the borders of other people. And remember, all actions involve the employment of scarce means, which means your property, your property right, things that you have a property right in, which would include your animals. So you could say that because you have the legally recognized right to control the dog and because no one else does, they can't restrain the dog. Um, then basically the dog is, a, is an agent of your will, right, and is going out and doing something that you are responsible for because it's like, it's like a, a, a proxy actor for you. Uh, just yeah. like if you had an employee and you said, listen, um, I've got a successful company. You know, let's say we're drilling oil wells and you use your profits and you hire employees and one, you, you tell one of them to go over to this unowned uh, area in Texas and, and, and homestead a, a well for you. Well, he's homesteading it on your behalf, so you would be the owner of the well, not him, even though it was his action or labor involved because of he's your agent and because of the contract between you. So I think uh, by some kind of analogy, you could say that your animals, um, at least in some cases, are performing actions on your behalf. So I would think you would owe restitution, at least in some cases. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Another question here. Uh, hello, this is uh, Joshua Stevens. Hey, Joshua. Hi there. Okay, so I had uh, two uh, brief questions. All right. I know that uh, <clears throat> you and Robert Wenzel are uh, supposed to be debating uh, IP issues. And yeah. I've heard him uh, mention that Dr. Rothbard, you know, while he for the most part didn't support uh, IP, mm -hmm. uh, 
right? Uh, <clears throat> he did support, I guess, the copyright. Uh, could you elaborate on that? He didn't support copyright. He supported, um, I mean, he was against state legislated patent and copyright schemes. But what he said was that in a free market, if you owned a product, you could have a contract with your buyer. So you sell something to a buyer, and you could limit what they what they purchase from you. So instead of selling them um, a mousetrap, let's say, you could only sell them basically a, a partial right to the mousetrap, like the right to use it for personal uses, and you would retain other rights, like the right to copy it, um, which actually doesn't make a lot of sense. I think he was confused on this, but I think what he was getting at was you could have a contract with your with your with your buyer, and you could say the buyer agrees contractually either that he's a co-owner of the mousetrap and you, he doesn't completely buy it and so that the seller still basically owns it and is only le lending it or leasing it or, or giving partial rights to the buyer so that if the buyer uses it in prohibited ways he's committing a type of trespass which is which is a, a imaginable relationship although it's not practically feasible um, or he's imagining a contract where the buyer buys the mousetrap but agrees that if he makes a copy of it let's say or if he learns anything from the mousetrap and makes an improved mousetrap on his own, then he agrees to pay some kind of damage payment to the seller, uh, which, which is also feasible but impractical um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's so hard to monitor these things. Uh, and a, a seller of, a, of an iPhone or a, uh, a mousetrap or a book, you know, they just want to get their money and be done with it. They don't have to monitor the activities of millions of people that, who, who are buying $10 or $100 items and nor do the buyers want to be monitored and nor do the buyers who pay a small fee for a useful item want to be limited in what they can do with it um, you know if I buy a book from someone for twenty dollars and the seller says I'm only going to sell you this book on the condition that you agree to pay me a million dollars if you make a copy of it or if you learn from it or you or it influences one of your novels in the future or if you loan it to a friend a lot. Most people would say, I'm not going to uh, take that risk on. Uh, it's not worth it to me to get a $20 novel. I'll, I'll just go pirate it you know, or make a photocopy for my friend, or I'll go buy a book from a more reasonable seller. Um, and even if the seller was able to persuade a few dupes to e enter into such a contract, it would only affect that m small number of stupid customers who enter into these contracts. It would not affect third parties. What Rothbard said was that if you sell the mousetrap and you stamp copyright on it, then it's understood by the buyer that he's only getting the right to use it for certain purposes but not the right to copy it. And therefore, under this sort of bundle of rights idea, the buyer doesn't own the entire mousetrap. So if he sells the mousetrap to his friend, then his friend can only get the rights that you know the the buyer had in it, which doesn't include the right to copy. So that's Rothbard's argument. The problem with it is that it sort of begs the question of whether there's intellectual property at all, because it assumes that there's property rights in knowledge, because it assumes that this third party needs the right to use the knowledge to make a copy of the mousetrap. In fact, he doesn't even need to buy the mousetrap or even need to use or touch the mousetrap to learn about it. He could. He could observe it from afar. He could learn from it from someone else, or just be dis have it, have it, have its operation described to him by the buyer or someone else. And so now he's in possession of knowledge, um, but he never in entered into a contract with the buyer or the seller. So he he could not be possibly bound by contract. And under mm -hmm. the first theory I mentioned, he wouldn't be guilty of trespassing either because he is not actually using the mousetrap. So under neither theory, which Rothbard doesn't really lay out explicitly, I'm just giving him the benefit of the doubt. I'm saying that's the only two possible theories he could use is that the buyer's misuse of the of the mousetrap would be a type of trespass or it would be a violation of contract. Whichever one it is, the third party is not guilty of either one because he's just using knowledge. Um, and he could, of course, spread that knowledge to other people, and then eventually everyone in the world knows about it. And not only that, to sell the mousetrap in the first place, the seller is promoting its benefits and its features. I mean, he's trying to say, my mousetrap is better than the, the old generation mousetraps. It's got these new improved features. He's advertising. He's telling the whole world. He's preaching it from the rooftops. He's already telling everybody what's innovative about this new mousetrap. 
So, it, you know, he can't expect people not to learn from that action. It's got really nothing to do with the buyer. So, um, the basic problem with this Rothbardian idea, and by the way, it, it contradicts Rothbard's views on defamation law, which is another type of intellectual property, which is in Ethics of Liberty, where he says that the problem with reputation rights, which is what defamation law protects, is that it presupposes that you have a right to your reputation, which is what other people think about you. And he says, well, it's obviously absurd for one person to have a property right in what other people think about him because you don't own their brains, basically. So similar reasoning would shoot down the IP idea, I think, because um, you don't have the right to what other people – what knowledge other people have in their heads and what they use to guide their actions. This is why I started out with praxeology because I think it helps to clarify this. It shows that you have property rights in scarce means, things that you can clash over, but you cannot have property rights in knowledge. Everyone's free to use the same knowledge as long as they acquired it um, – well, no matter how they acquired it, to be honest. As, as long, you know, Whatever information people have is going to guide their actions. They're going to have to consult it when they decide what actions to pursue and what means to employ to achieve their goals. Okay, and uh, one last brief question <clears throat> for me. <clears throat> All right, so I understand that, uh, like Dr. Uh, Hans Hoppe, he mentions that uh, he, you know, he promotes decentralization uh, as a way to end the state. And so I understand that in regards to like uh, immigration, he says, well, look, the taxpayers essentially – the, the roads are essentially, you know, their property, public property, essentially their property because their tax, their private property, which is uh, tax dollars, goes to fund and pay for. So if the, you know, if let's say in some city like I don't know Miami, uh, if voters says, if, if voters say, look, you know, we want to uh, crack down, you know, on uh, immigration or whatever the case may be, you know, uh, let's do that. But then I understand that Dr. Wal uh, Dr. Walter Block says. Okay, it doesn't matter. Roads are essentially open to the public. You know, you can't have, you know, uh, it, you try to initiate, you know, private property rights over that. What is your take on that? Between, you know, uh, let's say roads and immigration. So I think, well, first of all, Hoppe and Bloch and me uh, are all anarchist Austrian libertarians. And so our ideal uh, goal would be a totally private property society where there is no state in the first place. So there would be no such thing as immigration. It would make no sense. There would only be private property owners, and you could never enter someone's property without an invitation and would just be you know, totally the domain of private law. There would be no such thing as national borders, etc. What Hoppe is trying to point out is that, um, uh, is that in a second best or even third best sort of situation – what he's trying to point out is that the assumption everyone has that e even among radical libertarians like Rothbard, for example, there's sort of a background assumption that even though our modern liberal democracy system is not ideal, it was an improvement over what we had before, which was monarchs and kings. So what Hoppe tries to argue is that, number one, the move from monarchy to democracy after World War I was not really completely progress, that there were negative things about it, that in some ways monarchy is even better or less bad than democracy, although he explicitly rejects monarchy and democracy because he's an anarchist. But what he's trying to point out is he's trying to say that if you had to choose a less bad government, in many ways a monarchy would be better, and he, the reason is because the monarch has more uh, better incentives to more intelligently or efficiently run the country than a democracy does, and this is just… In a way, standard public choice, you know, type theory. You know, your elected representatives have an incentive to waste, etc. Whereas a monarch who had a property right in sort of the base of the country and could turn it over to his heirs has sort of an incentive for quality control, etc. It doesn't mean it's ideal or utopian. So he's kind of coming up with this monarchy versus democracy idea to criticize democracy, not to promote monarchy. And what he points out is that the the immigration policy of a monarch would be different than that of democracy for various reasons. Okay, um, the, the the rulers of a democratic society have an immigration policy designed to maximize their votes. So the Democrats might want more, um, uh, I don't know, minorities to come in because they're going to vote Democratic, etc. Um, whereas a monarch would be more concerned with uh, some kind of quality control, quality of life issues. So he would maybe let migrant workers in for a while but then keep them out because they're not part of the 
the, the kind of country. He's not necessarily supporting this. He's just kind of contrasting it to show that we shouldn't just assume that whatever the policy is in a democracy is compatible with or, or getting a, close to an approximation of a, a libertarian society. And then he also points out that when you have the government control over borders as we have now and you combine that with public property… And when you combine it with welfare, which he doesn't even really rely upon too much as his argument, what he's saying is that – the libertarian argument is that, well, because in a free society we wouldn't have any state with immigration controls, then an approximation of that in a democracy would be to have open borders. What he says is it's not so easy to make that, that call because there are good things about doing that and bad things. The good thing obviously would be there'd be no INS. There'd be no – you know. Um, Mexican immigrants going to jail, etc. But on the other hand, because of the government's public road system, which connects people's property, and because the government opens it to all, and because the government makes it illegal to discriminate based upon race or, race or ethnicity, that opening the borders in a publicly owned system like we have now where there are public roads… Leads to forced integration. It makes people have to bump up against each other or live next to each other or integrate with each other when they naturally otherwise wouldn't. So he's just pointing out one of the harms of having a state system in the first place. In other words, no matter what the government does, someone's going to be harmed. It's just like public education, right? I mean, if, if we have government schools, if they teach evolution, it's going to offend the Christians, creationists who don't believe in evolution, who are forced to pay for it with their tax dollars. But if they teach creationism, same thing for secular people. So there's really no answer. The only answer is to uh, return, you know, gradually move towards a private society, which is what he says. He actually opposes the federal government in an explicit statement from having control over this and to giving the control over immigration to – to states and then towns and cities and ultimately down to the private person. So that sort of goes along with the the typical decentralist or secessionist strategy that a lot of libertarians have, that uh, the smaller you make the political decision-making units, the more you, you do approximate um, an anarchist or free society, not because of the decisions that they make, but because it's a smaller and more granular decision-making process and because they're more likely to make decisions – that would be similar to what would happen in a free society. I don't know if I agree with him on that last part. That's more of a prediction. What he's saying is in a free society, you would have some sort of natural segregation or balkanization among ethnic and religious and um, uh, you know other, other grounds. And I think there's probably something to that because people do tend to associate uh, like with like to some degree. So in a free society, you could see you know different areas that have some – Racial or linguistic or ethnic uh, or historical backgrounds in common to some degree, but then they still trade with each other and they still you know visit with each other, but they have some kind of uh, you know Jewish community here, Hispanic community there, European community here, whatever you might have some of that. So what he's saying is if you if you made the decisions politically on a smaller level, it would tend to mimic that, which is what a monarch would do as well. So that's his basic argument. It's not anti-immigration. It's just anti-democracy, really. My name, my name is Donald Sheldon, and I've got a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, I'm old enough so that I kind of lived through the uh, creation of the Internet and the ideas of uh, property rights for uh, programs that um, have, we have now evolved so that you can indeed, of course, copyright things with our uh, knowledge based. And um, you have Microsoft out there with his uh, Bill Gates with his ownership of the uh, operating system that he runs on his computers. And then you have, of course, the open line of thinking where no one owns uh, Linux or the der derivation off of Unix that that is. And so there's a whole lot of people that think that whatever you create under that uh, genre uh, belongs to anyone who chooses to use it. And they want to allow, for example, all the um, basic uh, information to be available to anyone, as I say, just as a matter of utility. I, at one point, had a computer company back when 
AT&T still owned the rights to Unix. And um, my, uh, my young programmers went around that just almost instantly, uh, picking up from Berkeley and from other schools of the uh, source code off of Unix and using it prolifically and uh, never thought anything of it. Uh, it was just a whole different philosophy, if you will, mm-hmm. more, uh, more, more libertarian, I would say, mm-hmm. than, than not. But, um, but where do we come down really today from a practical point of view? You have enormous amounts of you know, money being exchanged over the rights to certain types of programs, many of which are quite simple and, quite frankly, could be easily duplicated. Well, I, I think uh, there have been a lot of statements made by people like um, either Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, some of these guys, saying that you know if, if the current patent and copyright laws and the way they apply to software had been in effect in, in the early days of the Internet, and not just the Internet, but computer technology 30, 40 years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, they wouldn't have been able to create what they've created. And a lot of European countries right now are having a lot, a lot of studies saying that, you know, one reason the U.S. Um, um, uh, has Facebook and Google and all these, or, or, or are they saying the one reason they don't have a lot of innovation is because of their stifling regulations. So, and, you know, uh, I think uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon thinks that uh, software patents are horrible, even though he's got a couple. Um, <laughs> but he thinks they should at least be reduced in terms um, I think the whole thing is a mistake. I think that this this whole dispute among you know the problem with engineers and software people um, and the open source movement, like Richard Stallman, they are working within a copyright and patent system. I mean, Richard Stallman is sort of a leftist, and of course they're confused on property rights. They don't even oppose copyright law. In fact, the idea of the open source license, you don't need a license without copyright because license is permission. You only need permission if someone has the right to stop you. They only have the right to stop you because of copyright. If you didn't have copyright, this whole debate would almost disappear. Uh, and in fact, it would change because um, you have people making a false equation, in my view, or a false analogy between um, the open source movement, and by the way, which is hypocritical because they're not for open source in the culture. Nina Paley's written about this. Richard Stallman and these guys are for open source in software, but not for open source in cultural works because they're not really against copyright. Um, but you, you, you have people assuming that the technologists who are open source versus the closed source guys are sort of a rough approximation of the anti-IP types and the pro-IP types. So they would make an equation between someone like me who's anti-IP and someone who's pro-open source. And I don't think that's actually correct. There is some connection between the openness attitude, which I talked about earlier. Once you recognize that information is a, it's a good thing for people to learn from each other, and competition is a good thing, and emulation of others is a good thing, that doesn't mean you have an obligation in a free market to spread to, to, to tell people your secrets. I mean, look, if you have a new idea and you want to keep it proprietary and you think you can do that, if you want to sell a, a software program and just let the executable go out there but keep your source code private, you've got every right to do that. And I don't know what business model is going to work better. The only thing is you can't rely or you should not be able to rely upon copyright to, pre- protect, to stop it. If someone is able to reverse engineer it or to compete with you and make a similar program, then that's just competition. That's just life, buddy. So... I would I would separate in my mind this open versus closed idea from the IP and copyright and patent idea. What we should as libertarians be in favor of, we should be in favor generally of the idea of a heritage of humankind, of the, of the idea of of the expanding pool of human knowledge, of scientific and literary progress. We should be in favor of emulation and learning and competition and cooperation. All these things, and we should be opposed to uh, monopolistic grants of privilege, which is patent and copyright. But that doesn't mean that every entrepreneur has to drop his panties and reveal his secrets to everyone. I think if you can find a business model that makes sense and you keep some of your some of your information proprietary and that works for you, that's fine. I just don't think that works very well for a lot of things. Like it doesn't work for a musician. I mean, the only way you're going to make sales or get famous is for people to learn your music or to sell a movie. But you could, you know, come up with a process to make a chemical, or um, again have a software program, and you keep some of your your secrets to yourself. Um, so there's nothing wrong with proprietary and closedness as long as you don't use 
government grants of monopoly privilege um, as a cudgel against your competitors. You have to rely upon um, just business models that you find as an entrepreneur that can work. Okay. I, I, I hear where you're coming from. It's still kind of nebulous to me, open source versus um, the patented and copyrighted types, but also the idea you've just mentioned of reverse engineering. Yes. Uh, you know, my experience with, uh, uh, I am not a computer programmer, let me say that, mm -hmm. but my experience with having computer programmers uh, in my company working for me uh, was that some of these kids are just unbelievably clever. Right. And they can, they can reverse engineer damn near anything and almost uh, as, as you speak. I mean, I had one that, that could think in machine language. Mm -hmm. Now, that just is scares, it scares me to death, and I'm fearless. I mean, you know. Well, what, 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 what scares you? What's, um, I mean, look, what's different from that in your mind with just the regular competitive process of the free market? I mean, you come up with a new car, or, or you come up with a new airplane model, or you come up with a new grocery store layout design, or you come up with a new fast food restaurant idea. If it's popular... Right, you're going to make profits, and those it's going to send signals out into the market, and other people are going to say, "Hey, you know, like Wendy's is going to open up after they see McDonald's and Burger King being successful." That's just the natural competitive process. What's what's wrong? What bothers you in your mind about the idea that someone might reverse engineer your ideas and compete with you? Nothing bothers me about it. I think that the barrier to enter generally is capital. If you've got enough uh, uh, money to get into the game and stay in the game long enough to be able to. Uh, copy whatever it is you choose to copy you can indeed uh do the, do exactly that the question becomes one of where where do we draw the line and is there any reason or have um, you, you said patents for example are not were frowned upon let's say by uh, libertarian thinking but why would there be an incentive to do anything uh in improving product or improving uh, the, the nature of uh, what's available to the public if there were right. not a protection uh, for 17 years, let's say, right. uh, for, uh, for, your, for your ideas having been put into the marketplace. Well, uh, well let, me, um, let me answer one other question first. You mentioned the open source thing. And let me just – my understanding of open source is that it's kind of a hack that Richard Stallman came up with. And what he did was he said that he's going to use the copyright system um, kind of against itself in a way. So what he, the idea of open source is that when you have a copyright in software – then you release it to the world with a license, and the license says that everyone's free to use this as long as they include a similar type of license in any derivative works they make from it or any use they make of it. So it's sort of like a worm almost. It spreads itself, and so I don't actually like – this is the – this is the. Um, it's similar to the Creative Commons um, uh, share alike idea. Um, I prefer the – to make it as open as possible and let anyone do what they want with it. But what he's trying to do is say that as long if you're going to have a new software project or program, if you're going to borrow any kind of open source software out there in the commons, now you've got to make your entire thing or at least parts of it open to the public under the same terms. So it's a way of giving people a choice. Either you join with us and you sort of give up your copyright rights um, or you can't use our stuff, which means we're going to assert our copyrights against you. So there's something about it. I don't like. But as, as for your other question, um, you said, what's the incentive to, say, innovate if you don't have a 17-year term? Um, I think there's a lot of problems with this way of looking at it. First of all, the purpose of law is not to make sure you have the right amount of incentives to innovate. In fact, there's no way we can know whether you have the right amount of incentives, and there's certainly no way the government can know this, and the government has no interest in knowing this. The government's in the thrall of... of, of of, uh, of lots of private interests, and it's not really trying to really fine-tune the knobs of the economy to maximize innovation. Uh, the reason the copyright term keeps going up and up and up is not because the Congress has made a, a wise choice to fine-tune the incentives. It's because Disney doesn't want the, the copyright on Mickey Mouse to expire, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and you say, what's the incentive? Now, that's a, the question is fine, but you have to realize that a question is not an argument. You can ask questions all you want, but if, if, if it's really just a hidden way of saying, unless you can prove to me that your system of freedom is going to result in X level of innovation, then I'm for patenting copyright. I mean, that doesn't follow in my, in my view. You've got, you've got to say what, what the purpose of property rights are and why 
some kind of state granted monopoly privilege is justified because it's clear that they undercut property rights. If you get a patent on, on your process, you can use the government courts to come in and tell me I can't use my factory in this way, right? So you actually have a lim you're putting a limitation on what I can do with my property rights. When I haven't done anything wrong to you, I haven't signed a contract from you, I might not, I might not even have learned of the process from you. I might have independently come up with it on my own. So in my mind, the patent system is completely illegitimate. And, but let's just take your question head on. You say, what's the incentive? Well, the incentive is you can sell products for a profit. Now, then you say, well, I face competition. Well, that's the free market. Yeah, of course you face competition. So you have to keep improving or you have to go in your reputation or your brand name, etc. But, but I would also say this. No one can seriously argue that if we eliminate patents tomorrow, let's say we eliminate patent law tomorrow, no one can seriously argue, and I don't think you would argue this, that we would have no innovation ever, that it would go to zero. I mean, we've had innovation before the patent system, right, which originated around 1623 um, and in a modern form in, in 1789 or 1790 in the U.S. There have been innovation for all of human history. So you can ask what, what the reason people do that is, and I think we know. We, people do it to make a profit because they're curious, because there's universities, because there's researchers, because the desire to expand knowledge is, um, is omnipresent among humans, or because some ideas time has come. I mean, you know, when certain theoretical ideas spread into the public, then the next revolution becomes possible. You know, transistors, quantum, tele you know, quantum computing maybe, uh, semiconductors, flying space shuttles, um, uh, you know, interballistic missiles, the atomic weapon, the atomic bomb, etc. Some ideas time just comes. And this is, this is why in the history of innovation and science, um, a lot of times there's a battle for who gets the patent. Now, why is there a battle? Because two or three or four people came up with the idea at the same time. Why is that? Well, because the idea was ripe. Its time had come. Right. Um, so, th but the bottom line is you, no one can argue that absent patent law, we would have no innovation. You and I no. both know there would be some innovation. So the only argument for a patent system is that Absent a patent system, we're going to have level X of innovation, but you and I, as some kind of central planners, know that X is not enough or it's not optimal. And with a patent system, it's X plus Y, and that's the right amount. Now, how do we know this? I've never heard anyone tell me what X or Y is, and I've never heard anyone even prove to me that Y is positive. And in fact, in my view, in all the studies I've seen, Y is negative. In other words, when you impose a patent system on society, you strangle and distort a lot of innovation. So... Who's going to come up with a new smartphone right now? You see Samsung and Motorola and Google and Apple fighting it out with hundreds and millions of dollars of, of fees paid to attorneys in bat patent battles all across the globe. Now, what small inventor is going to even try to enter into that? They know that if I came up with a new, a new phone, I'm going to be sued into oblivion by one or all of these guys. So what you have is you have two or three or four big players in different industries you know, aircraft, medical devices, software, um, uh, whatever, they dominate because of the patent and the copyright system. The patent and the copyright system erect barriers to entry and give rise to oligopolies and concentrated businesses and very large super companies. So Microsoft, for example, had monopoly profits because of copyright, because the copyright for years and years protected their Microsoft operating system. Then they use those monopoly profits to acquire patents. Now they have patents and copyrights, and they use those in tandem with each other to keep a, a lock on their monopoly position in the market. So it's really just not the case that patents, in my opinion, cause there to be extra innovation. In fact, they, they dissuade innovation. The people that are on top of a given industry have less of an incentive to innovate because they have a monopoly position on their earlier innovations. And other people on the outside have no incentive to even enter the field because they will be sued into oblivion. So I think they dissuade innovation. And even if you believe that a patent system would add a little bit more innovation, how do we know that it's worth the cost? So let's say this Y is another billion dollars worth of innovation, but the patent system imposes $40 billion of cost on the economy. Well, then it's not worth it. Right? Or let's say you said we need 17 years. Well, why not 
why not 28 years? I mean, we could get a little bit more innovation from increasing the term. Well, let's just go ahead and make it infinite. In fact, let's have the death penalty, right? I mean, let's, let's not just have civil penalties. Let's have the death penalty for violating someone's patent. The more you increase the scope and the strength and the enforcement of these patent rights, the more innovation you get. So where's the stopping point? And in fact, you could argue that even if we can maximize that, we have the death penalty in infinite patent terms, so we got x plus y innovation. Well, what if we had x plus y plus z? So why don't we tax everyone? Let's take a trillion dollars out of the economy by taxing the people, and let's let the, some government panel of experts give, give kind of rewards to really, really, really important innovators at the end of every year, some government panel of scientific experts. Okay, we could maybe incentivize another Z amount of innovation every year. Is that worth a trillion dollars? Is that worth the loss of liberty? I don't think so, but my point is this empirical, utilitarian, unprincipled line of thinking has no stopping point. And not only that, it has no basis in reality. It, at least the utilitarians need to tell me what X and Y and maybe Z are, but they never tell us. They never tell us what the cost of the patent system is. They never prove that it's even a positive net gain to innovation. So that's my basic um, utilitarian response. As a principled libertarian, I would be opposed to it anyway, just like I'm opposed to antitrust law, even if people would collude and set prices, and even if it would be uh, inefficient in the economy. I mean, people have a right to do what people have a right to do, in my opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on. All right, sure. Hello. 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 Hi, I saw your uh, your YouTube video on uh, rumpal.com. Can you please explain again why the rumpal.com people are correct? Well, you want me to explain <laughs> why the rumpal.com people are correct? Yes, yes, yes. I saw your. Can you make the arguments again? Oh, the rumpal. Yeah, the owners of the domain. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really know if they're correct. My, my view is that there should not be a, a, a trademark-based dispute resolution process. That trademark is yet another type of state-enforced intellectual property, which is totally illegitimate. And I can give you reasons for that if you want. But trademark is not as bad as patent and copyright, but it's also illegitimate. Um, everyone says that trademark is legitimate because fraud is wrong. Deceiving customers is wrong. But, you know, if that's all you cared about, then we have fraud law already. Trademark goes beyond that, and trademark says that um, someone who is using a mark in commerce for like a brand or something like that can prevent their competitors from using a similar mark if it's likely to, con to confuse some consumers uh, or if it dilutes the value of that mark. Now, now, the problem with that is that, number one, you don't actually have to prove anyone was defrauded, and number two, the cause of action should not be on the behalf of the trademark user. It should be on the behalf of the defrauded consumer. Okay, so the problem with trademark law is it basically permits legal bullying, just like patent and copyright do. Um, and because the state has foisted this this law on 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 our on our on the on the private legal systems of the world, when the internet I can branched out, the the United States government um, insisted that. The ICANN, which is quasi-private, sort of like the Federal Reserve is, they insisted that they adopt the Uniform Dispute Resolution Rules to enforce trademark law. So the state basically wormed its trademark IP law into the very structure of the Internet as a way of helping to enforce trademark law. So the problem is that the rules exist. They would not exist if the government hadn't influenced ICANN. They wouldn't exist if the government didn't have its illegitimate trademark law. So the problem is the existence of the rules, just like the problem is the existence of patent and copyright law. Um, can I blame Apple for suing Samsung for patent infringement? I don't know. That's an ethical question. I, I suppose that given the patent system, Apple sitting on a potentially $50 billion valuable patent lawsuit, that they may be irresponsible if they didn't file the suit. Maybe they'd be ousted by their shareholders, or maybe the board of directors would be sued in a derivative action for, you know, for uh, not feel living up to their fiduciary responsibilities. I mean, if I was the head of Apple, I wouldn't want to sue someone for patent infringement, but, you know, I'd be using my personal belief in against patents. I'd be gambling Apple's cash with that, basically. So I'd be using 
someone else's assets for my personal pet hobby. So, I don't know. I can't say that Ron Paul himself is wrong for filing the suit. Uh, I think it's wrong because he doesn't need to do it. He could have just bought it. Uh, hell, for the amount of money he might spend on lawyers, he could probably get Ron Paul as a domain, right? There's a new procedure to actually get a new... You can actually get your own custom domain for about 100K. So he could have like Ron... Uh, Ron at whatever, you know, Ron Paul dot Ron Paul. He could do that if he wanted to, is my understanding. Um, so I think basically the, the trademark law of the government, which is unlibertarian and unjust, has wormed its way into the, the property rules of the Internet and has allowed it, – it, it allows you to – it's like using eminent domain. There are eminent domain statutes out there. Walmart can go to a local city council – and they can try to bribe or persuade the, uh, you know, the local government to take someone else's property and sell it to Walmart at a below rent price, so they can build a superstore. Now, is the problem that Walmart takes advantage of eminent domain laws, or is the problem that the there are eminent domain laws? Of course, the latter is the problem. Is the problem that people apply for welfare, or that we have welfare laws? You know, we shouldn't have the welfare laws, and we shouldn't have trademark law, and it should not. Uh, infect the uh, the internet's uh, dispute resolution laws. So that's my basic position: is that this is a use of trademark law to take someone else's contractual uh, property rights. Mr. Kinsella, we have uh, one last question. Okay. Uh, from Christopher Delama, and um, <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Um, we've uh, learned a lot, and I'm sure some things went over our heads, but. Uh, <laughs> We'll uh, delve into it later and, and I guess get a better perspective on, on that. But, sure. Uh, thanks for everything. Sure. Here's uh, Christopher. All right. So my question is basically I've always felt like there's a bit of a disconnect or like a philosophical contradiction between the support and protection of physical property rights and intellectual property rights. It seems like they would kind of both be... be protectable under the same philosophic premise that it's of your making, it's it's your own creation, and as a result, it's yours to do with as you please. Can you right. kind of elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, I, I guess there's a couple ways to approach it. Um, um, one way to think about it, look, Im imagine that you, I think most of us, at least most libertarian-leaning people, we, we don't have a controversy that there ought to be property rights in physical things, right? So that's not controversial, right? The question is whether there ought to also be property rights in intangible things or in mental constructs and things like that. Um, so, so, so let's suppose you own a uh, let's say let's suppose you own a farm and you're next to someone who has another farm, and let's suppose your neighbor would like to take a shortcut across your property. Cause, because it would save him time traveling to uh, town, okay? So he might approach you and say, hey, would you mind if I, um, if I use your property every day just to take a shortcut across this back corner of your property to go to town? And you might agree to that. You might sell, it, you might sell him that right for a price. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Mr. Kintel? Yes, Hello? 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 Yeah. Can you guys hear Sorry, me? Sorry, you, bro you broke up a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, you broke up a little bit, I, like last few seconds. Yeah. How about I now? Know. Yeah. So well, I'm just trying to point out the conflict between – it's just like um, if, you, if you said, look, I believe in negative rights, like the right not to be aggressed against. But I also believe in positive rights, like the right to, the right to an income, or the right to education, or the right to health care. Well, we libertarians realize that these positive rights don't come for free. They always have to come at the expense of negative rights. Right? If you have a positive right to um, a job or education, that means other people have the positive obligation to provide you with it, and that infringes upon their right to be left alone. Right, because you have to tax them basically, or make them pay for it. So you have to take their property away. So nothing can come for free. So if you have property rights in in material resources, 
the grant of an intellectual property right is effectively what I would classify under the civil law as what's called a negative servitude or a negative easement. Okay, but the the problem with that is that uh, because and the reason is because it gives the holder of the patent or the copyright a veto right over how you use your property. He can tell you you may not use your property in this way unless you get my permission. Now the problem is he never acquired that right from you by contract or as a result of some kind of trespass or tort that you permit committed. Normally he can have such a right, but only if the owner of the burdened property agrees to it. That's why I was given the example about um, two neighbors who one of them wants to um, a purchase from the other a right to cross his property like a right of use every day to go to town. Or let's say we have a neighborhood with restrictive covenants where everyone says, listen, our property value is going to be better or enhanced. Our, our standard of living will be enhanced if we all agree that we're not going to use our property for, um, for, for pig farming, only for residential purposes. Unless we get the permission of all the neighbors. So everyone could agree to this in a restrictive covenant or an easement. They could give up their rights contractually. They could effectively give their neighbors a veto over some uses of their property in exchange for getting a similar veto right over their other uses. This is perfectly legitimate, but only because it was contractually agreed to by the parties. What we have with patent and copyright is the government just grants this negative servitude or this negative easement to some inventor or some designer of a song, even though the guy who he has a veto right over never agreed to it. So it's a transfer or a taking of property rights from the person who is now limited in what he can use his own property for. So that's the fundamental problem with it, is you cannot grant, you can't expand property rights without taking property rights away. Now, the question was about, well, if you create something, why don't you have a property right in it? The problem with that question is, is it assumes that creation is the source of property rights to material goods in the first place, but it's not. It, it never was. It's not an independent source of property rights. The only source of property rights is either contract or original appropriation. Original appropriation means you, you somehow embolder or transform an unowned scarce resource, thereby establishing a better claim to it than anyone else, or you acquire the resource from a previous owner by contract. Those are the only ways to acquire property and things legitimately. So creation has nothing to do with it. The mistake is that creation um, is valuable and useful because it is a way of transforming things that you already own into a more valuable arrangement. So when, when you transform things or when you use your intellectual creativity right, or when you labor on things, you do create wealth which just means that you make the things you own more valuable, right? So if you transform your paint and your canvas into, a, into the Mona Lisa, <coughs> you don't own the Mona Lisa painting because you created it. You own it because you already owned the resources that went into it. You had to own them to, tr to work on them in the first place. Your labor made it more valuable, but it didn't give you more property rights. Okay, so there's a myth or a mistaken idea that creation is a source of property rights. And if you accept that myth, then you can slide into this idea, well, I, you can own property by finding it, by buying it, by contract, or by creating it. So why can't you own a poem or a song or a movie or an invention that you create? Well, the, the fallacy in that idea is that you don't own things in the first place because you create them. Creation is, a, is the means of wealth, not the means of property rights. Um, so that's the fundamental uh, a problem with uh, with property rights in intangible things is that they have to come at the expense of existing property rights. Now, there's one more argument that people make, and they say, well, what's wrong with the idea that uh, some inventor can limit how I use my property? After all, property rights aren't unlimited anyway. In other words, I can't swing my fist when it hits your nose. I can't shoot my gun if you're standing in the way. So your property rights always interfere with how I use my property. So what's wrong with another limitation? Well, you can't just – you know, just because some limitations on, on your use of property are legitimate doesn't mean every limitation is. By that argument, you could murder anyone or rape anyone or steal. You could say to the victim, why are you complaining? After all, property rights are limited. I mean it just makes no sense. You have to have a good argument. You have to have a good reason to limit someone's property. And the reason that we libertarians think 
some actions are limited, not property rights, but actions, is because they infringe on others' property rights. I can't shoot my gun at you because it would invade your property borders. So the reason I can't perform certain actions is because of property rights. So you can't take that argument that the sanctity of property rights means some actions can't be f f performed to say that any limitation on property rights is therefore legitimate. It just doesn't follow at all. All right. Cool. Thanks. Sure. All right. Hello? Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Mr. Castello. It's uh, Luis Rivera. Hey, Luis. Um, I want to thank you uh, again for um, speaking to us and answering all our questions. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of everybody else because I have uh, the headset. We had a problem with the audio. So I guess you can hear him clap. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I'm glad we got the technical stuff worked out, and I enjoyed it. Thanks for your um, your uh, intelligent and uh, polite questions, guys. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.